Thank you so much for joining us here this afternoon. We are going to be reviewing one of my most favorite wines uh, that we produce here today, and it is our 2018 Reininger Mr. Owl's Red. Here, I'll let you get a good look at that. And today, I have a very special guest here because I'm going to be checking this wine out and reviewing it with my good friend, Mr. Owl here. <laughs> so we're going to talk about this wine and review it for you today and uh, tell you all about it. First of all, Mr. Owls has a wonderful, fun, fun history. Um, with that, I'm actually going to introduce the real Mr. Owl and also our winemaking team. So guys, come on, come on in. So we're going to say goodbye to uh, our friend, Mr. Owl here, our other one. We'll put him up here on his perch for right now so he can look after us. Make sure that we're doing everything correctly here. Uh, so uh, many of you know these two characters. Um, say ugliness surrounded by beauty here. <laughs> they have much nicer smiles than me. There's no question about that. So on my left here, which is your right probably looking at the screen, is the real Mr. Owl. So this is Raul Morphine. Raul is our assistant winemaker here at Reininger and Helix Wines. Uh, Raul started working with us in 1999. He didn't like wine at the time, and uh, but we needed him for his brute strength. Right, Raul? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so he had plenty of brute strength. A lot stronger. A lot younger. <laughs> yeah. And how young were you then? 19? I was 21. 21? So um, it was great. He started part-time with us when we were out at the airport in 1999, a very special year uh, for us. If you've been in the winery and you've seen our uh, big painting here in the winery that was done by Jeffrey Hill, uh, Mr. Raul is very prominent in it. In fact, the original Mr. Owl's label had that image off of that painting of this wonderful young man. But when Raul started with us, he didn't even like wine. And uh, so uh, he went from Coors Light, well, I shouldn't say that. The only, the only fault he has is that he's stuck on Coors Light. So, and we have a saying here that it takes a lot of damn good beer to make damn good wine, so I buy all the damn good beer. <laughs> <laughs> right? So, um, but anyway, he uh, learned to love wine and actually started his own wine called El Corzo. So, um, El Corzon is made here during harvest, and as soon as it gets the barrel roll, you take it over to your one out of the airport, and they have a tasting room in downtown Walla Walla on uh, uh, Spokane Street. Sorry, it's in South Palouse. Oh, Palouse, that's right. It's right over Mill Creek, so if you get a chance, real funky little winery there, so uh, get a chance, stop by there. So really proud of uh, what Raul has accomplished here So at, at our winery. And uh, the other gentleman, the, the real good looking guy here <laughs> on, on my right, your left. <laughs> that, that'd be Dorian. And Dorian is our cellar master here at the winery. And uh, many of you know him from the tasting room for many years. Uh, what, three or four years in the tasting room? Something like that. Yeah. Something like that. And, uh, <laughs> and then he's been, what, four years, five years now? Yeah, 2016. 17, something like that, 2016, 17. Good, good deal. Well, we have a great production crew here and we're just getting really ramped up and amped up for the coming harvest. So what's really fun about this Mr. Owls uh, that's 2018 that we're gonna be tasting here um, is I, I, it's really opening up and showing itself much earlier than the 2017. So really, really happy about that. But a little background on Mr. Owls, we started it in uh, 2000 was our very first, uh, no, 2002. 2002 was our very first, was our very first vintage of it. And uh, we did it uh, on the slide with Mr. Raul here. We put this whole blend together and uh, we bottled it. But when we bottled it, uh, I sent Mr. Raul off on a uh, little, uh, uh, mission anyway, errand, and so he was gone while we bottled the Mr. Owls, and we didn't put the labels on the outside of the boxes. And uh, so when he came back to the winery, he saw these 
cases without any labels on it. And we had to tell them that we ran out of labels. And, uh, <laughs> two weeks later, we threw a party in honor of Raul and uh, kind of released uh, Mr. Owl's Red. But the story behind Mr. Owl's Red is back there in 1999, when we were out at the Walla Walla Airport when he first started working with us, um, our kids, I should say my kids, uh, Tessa, who's now 24, and Reed, who's 22, they were, oh gosh, two and a half years old then and uh, three and a half years old. And uh, they would come out to the airport and they would walk in the winery out there at the airport and they had a difficult time saying uh, Raul. And so whenever they'd walk in the door, it'd always come out, hi, Mr. Owl. And so <laughs> we started calling him Mr. Owl. So that's where Raul got his Mr. Owl uh, nickname. And uh, hence uh, we went on to, uh, make a wine anyway in honor of him. Um, but uh, so I had a big hand in uh, the first year or two, maybe three, uh, putting that blend together. Um, but um, since then, it's for the most part been Raul uh, with my approval at the, at the end. But uh, Raul puts the blend together and uh, we really love it. So Raul, you know what? I'm just... How about you talking about the blend in general over the years? What we've, uh, what you, what we've done, and what you, what you like, and the types well, of what I like, type of grapes that you like to use. I really like using Syrah because Syrah is my favorite grape. That's first why I use Syrah. Yeah, we always and have to, like to order an extra ton of Syrah just so he play them all. <laughs> he, he eats it on the, off the sorting table, man. So pretty much every Mistral Red has quite a bit of Syrah in it. And I like the Mistral Red being a little more bigger in tannins, which this one, to me, is the, the only one. It's a little softer in tannins, and, but it's really well balanced. I like the acid in it, but it's really, the, I think, the one that has the less, the, uh, like the less tannins. Mm -hmm. So because the other ones, they're a little more medium, more beefy, a little more tannin, so mm -hmm. that's, that's the only thing. Kind of like Raul, more reflection of you, a little beefy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so tell, tell us what, um, you were talking about Syrah, that how much you love Syrah, and if anybody's been around the winery during harvest, and uh, watch this guy work around Syrah, yeah, he can't keep his hands off of it. Um, we lose a lot of money to that. Um, <laughs> to grazing on Syrah all the time, but that's all right. Um, what, what about Syrah that you're just so in love with? Well, Syrah to me, I like, like, I like Syrah because it's kind of, first of all, because it's, it's kind of meaty mm -hmm. and also the color is kind of really dark color. Mm -hmm. And when we harvest, it's always like, I shouldn't say shrivel, but it's kind of more. Mm -hmm. I know what you're talking about. about little bit of a shrivel in yeah. it and it always it's like a little more sweeter and I think it's like the flavors are more concentrated mm. and that's what I like mm. so uh, and that's why I'm always eating it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah you, 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 there's also kind of a little oftentimes a little fleshiness a little smoky but the way that we like our Syrah too is we kind of like to get that blueberry mm -hmm. aspect mm -hmm. in it too. Syrah can sometimes lean cherry, can lean blueberry. And and Syrah, I think, is kind of a little tougher wine to make because it always tends to be a little like a A2S to it, like a little mm -hmm. reductive. Reductive, to it. yeah. yeah. And so it's a little more tougher to make, but I love it. We can. We can take care of it, we can fix it. Yeah. Well, this particular blend, um, if I recall, it's 41% Cabernet Sauvignon, 26% Syrah, 23% Merlot, 4% Cab Franc, and 4% Petit Verdot, and 2% Malbec. And um, to me, too, um, this guy, I think it has um, it's a it's a very food friendly wine uh, this year it's because um, even though it doesn't have an inordinate amount of acid in it, it um, the acid shows up more uh, to yeah. me than I think in past vintages. Yeah. 
which is nice though, especially that's the kind of one of my favorites of the characteristics of the Mr. Owls. It's always like a, a new experience, right? It's just like, what does Raul want to execute this year, right? Like we definitely know the ball Besides part. me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Besides getting the okay from Chuck, it's really a matter of like, all right, that's the, I think from the third, I mean, from the third guy on the team, that's the fun part of like, watching what we do for Helix, watching what we do for Reininger, watching what we do for CPR, and then literally watching Raul almost treat the Mr. Owls like his own version of a CPR. It's his no boundaries, no restrictions. Um, and that's what makes it fun, right? Because it's almost like a mini label within Reininger. Well, there are boundaries. I mean, it's a Reininger one. Well, so well it's meaning, it's meaning like, a, yeah, I, I get what you're saying. Yes, with uh, Walla Walla, obviously, is with Reininger, with Reininger, but meaning that there's not an old world versus a new world flavor profile that we're attacking. That's what I mean by the note. So my apologies for that. We're, we're more going for a flavor profile uh, in the valley, and that's what I think is fun. It's almost like learning another label and you to build in every year. So it's a fun experience from my perspective to kind of be the second hand or third hand or fourth hand man to these blades, you know what I'm saying? Like well, I think it's also it. fun for you is um, you you see so much of what I like over the years and um, Raul has, you know, obviously picked up so much of that too. But you also, I think for you learning, and for me too, I think it's fun to see, you know, letting Raul loose on his own. Yeah, that's, I guess that's what I meant by the seeing, no boundaries, I guess. Yeah, yeah exactly. Seeing, seeing what his thoughts are making thoughts are right now. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, yep. So it's a lot of fun. Well, you know, the color on this, I think, this year is really wonderful. It's got this brightness to it. It's got this great, uh, I think, garnet purple color to it and some, like I said, beautiful brightness to it. Um, the wine, to me, is a lot, you know, you, I see it in the nose and, um, uh, Man, I, you know, I get this kind of black raspberry and maybe even a little bit of a hint of current going on in there. What, what are some of the things that you guys are picking I, up in the, in the nose? For me, the, the um, anise, I definitely get the anise for me on the nose, for sure. I, like Raul said, plum. For yeah, sure. I get plum. So you get a little of that anise spice. Yeah, I definitely do. Kind of thing going on there. Definitely on the nose, yeah, you know, makes, yeah, that too. makes a makes an appearance, you know. It's I wouldn't say it's the primary or secondary. Um, yeah, it's some fun in there with the under underlying spices and and uh, so there's um, 26% to uh, new oak on this. So it's a judicious use of oak. It's um, definitely not overrun by oak at all. To me, mm. the, the fruit really, really. That's what's nice. The spices kind of come in. I like the spice that you kind of get from the oak. You know, I think it's a nice little underlying uh, characteristic there. It's nothing too aggressive, but it's definitely letting you know it's there. Um, not too over oak, but no, I, I can see the oak. Like yeah, it makes an appearance. A little like I can you know, like maybe a little coconut. Like from oh, oak. Okay, yeah. Yeah, the hint, hint of coconut there. Sure. Like from the oak, yeah. Sure, absolutely. A little bit. I'm even getting some of the spices on the taste though. Probably like three quarters of the way in. I'm definitely starting to get some of the. Yeah, I can't eat like a bright Bing cherry. Um, like say a little you know, some current going on and there. You mentioned the poem, I agree with you there. You know, one thing that really, sometimes in the past, I'm not catching it so much today. I've gotten a little bit of um, oralness out of it, maybe because we're still coming up from cellar temperature on this, um, but I'm not quite getting as much uh, pronounced floral tones as, I, as I've gotten in the past, you know, a little bit of uh, dried rose petal and stuff going on in there. Um, to me, today, it's just definitely more fruit and the, the cherry seems to know, brighter cherry yes. seems to be I'm with you on the cherry. coming out much more than it has in the past, you know, in the last, you know, couple of weeks, a couple of times that we've been trying this. And so, but what really stands out to me in this wine is to me, it really, Seems like a great 
more all around food wine just because of that perceived acidity to it mm -hmm. is man i lately i've been uh getting into uh, some uh Piemonte wines and um so Bares barbaresco and barolo and um so i've been really intrigued with the acidity uh in in those wines and uh and you know that wonderful which is nebbiolo grape um but uh so i'm intrigued again with the acidity here so it's just something kind of my little exploratory world recently has been off in uh, wines that red wines that are showing really nice acidity and uh, this is this is there with it so I think mm -hmm. well, sorry. <clears throat> this quick question for you from the winemaker's perspective. That'd be him. Well, no, this is no, it's, it's literally for a, it's a question for you about him. What, from your perception, what is it like seeing Raul from the day one that you met him versus now the guy who's consistently knocking out blends? You know, you've really seen his taste and palate evolve. You've really seen him sort of fine tooth mm -hmm. comb, big and varietals. He's definitely matured. Way. He's not as cocky as he Definitely, I look at him and I'm like, oh, you guys are equal, and that's my equal. But um, one thing Raul is really, um, you can turn away or something, <laughs> um, but um, he's, he's very observant. Not only, you know, he's a very smart person, yeah. um, and, and he's very efficient, but he's also, he's also very, very observant. And so um, over the years, you know, with working with the different grapes, he's really picked up the subtleties in the, um, uh, the, gosh, what I'm wrong, uh, the word I'm looking for, the uniqueness of, of the different grapes. Mm. Um, and, and not only just the grapes themselves, but say in a cold vintage, cooler vintage mm. versus a warmer vintage. And so um, he's really picked up a, a lot of that. And we see that with the blending, you know? Yeah. We're sitting around doing blends and stuff, and yeah. we, we yeah. Uh, throw, throw things out there. And so we say, okay, well, we need to, we want to bump up the tannin structure, or we want to bump up the acidity, okay what out there in our cellar, what are we going to be able to use, mm. you know, and he's always has really great insight into, uh, um, what to, you know, so, um, yeah, it's, uh, you guys, uh, we make a good team. Thank you. Okay. Well, I think my, I think one of my favorite things to learn from Raul, from Raul, not only is like the consistency, right. And like, he's never on the mountaintop. He's never in a valley, right. He's always on a plateau. Right, like he's very steady minded for the most part. We'll we'll say ninety nine point nine percent. That's almost an A plus, right? But oh man, man. Um, some, some some days. Man. <laughs> it's usually it's, once once a year, once a year during harvest, it's always one day. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, if you can see some odd days, that's yeah. good. But the the memory of an element, like literally Raul remembers. Yeah, like, yes, and yes. that's the part that's like super fun and exciting to work around because like, hey, do you remember this vintage from this time? We did this and this and this. And I'm like, <laughs> no, I don't, but you do. So I was with you. So, you know, and that's just something yeah, that is so much fun having that insight. Yeah. 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 Uh, what, what we have just going on in the cellar. I, you know, I, gosh, I, you know, sometimes I come to work without my shirt on. You know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I forgot to put that on. <laughs> I'm getting older. I keep forgetting a little bit. Well, anyway, um, what how, what else about about the flavor? Um, to me, you know, earlier is you know in the past is not it seemed um, uh, kind of almost a there's a little chalky texture to it, and um, which is really indicative of a lot of you know bigger red wines, but. Um, I'm beginning to see that even mellow out yeah. a little, little yeah. bit. Would you guys? I agree. You guys think? I yeah. agree. This is great. I can throw anything out there and ask them, do you agree? No. Uh, no. 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 <laughs> I don't I say it. no. I don't think so. No. <laughs> That's actually what I really love about this place. So it, it came to tell it how it is. And, uh, the, uh, I, I push for them to uh, disagree with me and to really throw out their opinions. And, that whole thing's back. So, um, but uh, yeah.
it's uh, gosh, yeah, the nose is just that almost kind of reminiscent of a, in some ways, San Giovese, just in the sense that um, this sa like sour curry, I'm almost right okay. now with the acid and stuff, just kind of getting a little sour cherry. On the nose? In there, yeah, in the nose. I'm with you. But, no, I ask you guys a question? Yes, please. Can you guys talk a little bit about how this wine varies from vintage to vintage, maybe more historically than it will moving forward with the production um, as high as it is now, but? Oh, you, you mean just our, um, the different differences between different vintages, but then also the fact that we are ramping up production a little bit more of this? Yes, yeah, like at this one, I feel compared to everything else in the portfolio for Reiniger, used to vary a lot. Like the 2011 was a super Tuscan. The 2012 was 60% Malbec. Um, well, you know, we threw, you know, the San Giovese in there. That was one of those years where we, we really needed to bump the city. Um, that's why we threw the San Giovese in there. Typically, um, it's not in there, but I should actually let Raul speak to it more than myself. But do you remember that's why we put that San Giovese in there? Was that was what vintage was that? What was she's so good? What was it? 2000? Yeah, 2011. Yeah, that's what I like to blend with Raul's bread because it's always a little different, but uh, I, I can start working with some of the wines that we have. If, like this time around, like the 2018, I thought first we keep adding cab and I thought it was too much tan, it's too big. That's why I throw a little bit of cab front to tone it down. Mm -hmm. So it. all depends on how the blend tastes, then I can say, okay, I can throw this, this wine after this grape out there. Like I throw the cab front to soften it down a little bit. That's why it kind of mm. every year is a little different, mm. different grapes. The only main one that I like to use is like Syrah because, uh, because I think it has a lot of, is, Syrah is always kind of really fruit forward. That's kind of mm -hmm. always like Syrah and then the color is really intense. That's why mm -hmm. I kind of want to use Syrah all the time. So but the, the, the West time. goes because I think, because every year, every vintage is different. So I start blending, but then I go, okay, it needs more tannin, so I can use, I go taste all the barrels and I can Petit Verdot, maybe. Petit Verdot or maybe more Cab. And this time I was using a lot more Cab. And then when I blended, put the, the blending trials together, I thought, no, I think this has too much tannins. And it was leaning almost to a bitter side. So I go, okay, it needs to, tone it down a little bit. So that's why I use Cap Franc. Mm. And someone was like, okay, I'd be good with a Cap Franc, but I, <laughs> I think he toned it down too much. Yeah, and the Cap Franc also adds a little berry character to it, especially from the XL vineyard there too. And it, XL has just really wonderful um, fruit forward, berry, red berry character to it. And, uh, yeah, so, but the, the life, the evolution, if you will, of um, Mr. Owl's Red, it always started out for you to been real small uh, production anyway. Um, you know, about 150 to 200 cases and so, but now actually we've, uh, with our new label, um, we have decided to up the game and actually put it out there with our distributor ones. So you can see it's, it's a fun, fun label here. And, um, you know, it's using those mountain motifs from our regular Reininger uh, label, in fact. Um, so we're using those little triangle mountains. Let me see if I, oh, okay, I'll use our, this guy right here. So you can see on our labels there, if I can get the right angle. Sorry. These little mountain motifs that are on there. So we use those little delta, what we call delta triangle mountains there. And um, our graphic artists transfer them over in Seattle. 
Uh, they did a really great job and uh, came up with this. They made a, an owl using those little triangle uh, mountain motifs. So um, anyway, with that, we're, we're stepping up our uh, production, or uh, uh, just we're putting it out there actually for our distributors. And uh, so um, we did close to, I think it was around 540 something cases, I believe, of this wine this year. Um, so, um, there's, it's just a fun, fun, always fun project, you know, to give, uh, Raul a little more creativity, um, um, here in our winery. So he, he, I shouldn't speak for him, but it's, it's fun give, giving him a little autonomy here. Well, actually, he has a lot of autonomy. <laughs> 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 but that's how much, uh, you know, we trust him. So, um. But uh, it's good too. But we've been the last couple of years. We've been ramping up the Mr. Owls more, so you're, you're seeing more and more of it. And we want it to be a real, uh, an approachable, affordable wine too, and uh, good, good all around wine. So th those are kind of the parameters, you know, that we have for it. And with that, you know, he's, you know, up to, up to the races with it. So. Um, yeah, we're we're super proud of it and uh, love love what it does. And what Raul's done with it, and um, one thing that I've really noticed um, in general speaking about the 2018 vintage versus 17. The 17 vintage was a big vintage, but um, the Bordeaux varietals in particular um, were really close. I mean, so they're they're structurally um wonderful wines um uh, flavor wise but they they're uh, a lot more closed than the 2018 we're seeing that the 2018 vintage anyway the wines are uh, opening up much earlier on them and uh this is evident with this wine and the, like the uh, 2018 vdx and just all the wines as we're tasting them uh before release before we're releasing them um, That's one of the general comments about 2018 versus 2017. Um, um, but with speaking about 2018, I mean, us three know how difficult it was blending 2018 vintages across the board. With that being taken into consideration, how happy are you with how this is showing right now? I think it's showing awesome. I'm really happy with what it's showing right now. Do I thought it was going to be a little more. Closer, close because yeah, it's not that long that we can. Um, do you want to give them a little bit of an insight on the difficulties that we were, the, some of the hurdles, you know, how how abnormal it was for for blending in 2018? Usually, blending trials is something we knock out pretty with confidence in a short amount of time. But just kind of go over the 2018, what that was like for you, you know, the challenges that we faced for blending that vintage. Well, we came every morning and try to blend it, to make the blends, but it was just not working. And every, it took probably a week to create the blend or two weeks, mm -hmm. but that yeah. was not gonna yeah, That was a hell of a lot easier than 2017 was by far our most difficult year. I was gonna say 17 was the, the that was, hmm, that was the, the nightmare for yeah. it as far as blending. This year, actually, I thought the blending whole overall process went really. Seventeen, smooth. I think you were mix matching the messages. Yeah, yeah. yeah. seventeen was the, the seventeen was year. the nightmare. By far, that was the most difficult vintage that, uh, that I've experienced. Yeah, I don't know why I thought of, that's what's funny is the, the all the it's clearly just the vintages start to blend together. Oh, <laughs> you know, like mm, the vintages definitely start to. 17. It's okay, call me out. I have no problem. You know. You're getting old. Yeah, I mean, 29 is really wearing on me. You know what I'm saying? It's really getting heavy these days. Yeah, you know. Abby, do we have any other questions out there? We have a lot, yes. Um, so I guess the big thing I was asking, what vintages people are drinking? Because um, not everybody has the 2018 in front of them tonight. Um, so some people have the uh, 2009 um, the 2012 and like the 2008. Um, what is your favorite vintage? 
as far as Mr. Owls goes? Yes, yeah. I have to, um, you know, 2000 actually was a lot of fun. I really, really liked that at the 2003. Um, and um, actually, this one I can tell is going to be right up there. But I'm curious for Mr. Raul here, Mr. Owl himself. I like the one was, uh, to me, one of the, my favorite ones was the one, it was 2011, the one we did a lot on Molbeck, I think was uh, 2000. Oh, wow. Yeah, tell this one. <laughs> Yeah, the one we added. Here, I forgot which. Out. I'm going to get it real quick. It's right there. Oh, look. Yeah. Sorry. I think so, that's why I, I did pull up the blends of all of the vintages I could find. Um, no, I, uh, we have the book right here. 20% Malbec, 20% Syrah, um, 15 Merlot, and 5% Petit Verdot. That, that was the 12, uh, Mr. Alice, Abby, that you were talking about just now? Yep. That was the one. Yeah, that was, that, that, to me, that was one. One of my favorites. Yeah, I like that. I, I really like it. There's a lot of blackberry in that one. Yeah. With that all that. But, uh, yeah, here, here we go. So, yeah, in fact, yeah, that was a, that was yeah, half, almost 50%. Yeah. It's actually more than that. Yeah, that was, yeah, that was a really fun one. So, but, uh, how about you? Do you have you have a favorite? So it's between for me. It's between two thousand nine. Um, ooh, okay, two thousand nine because that was the vintage that we were pouring when I first started here. So it's kind of sent into it. And then for me, it's the eleven and uh, last year's the seventeen. The seventeen. The seventeen was killer. I thought it was just the epitome of dangerous in the bottle. Like it just, <laughs> I couldn't wait to get to that one. You know, it was just one that I, that was one that was a standout to me. 17 Mr. Owls. Um, but I love this one for how approachable it is at this time, knowing how Raul likes to structure it. You know what I'm saying? So like you guys had mentioned earlier that the acid's really playing a big part in this. So I really appreciate that um, um, at this point in time. Yeah, and like I say, it's not a, a ton of acid. I mean, it's a it's a regular amount of acid. There's six point two grams per liter um, acid in this, which um, for any of our red wines is actually in the normal range, anywhere from five point nine to six point two. Um, but to me, even for six point two, it's it, the perception is a little, a little bit more acid there, but um, I really love the whole structure of it. Um, it's got some, the really the tannins are just very smooth, uh, laid, they're laying out very, very beautifully on this. And um, as we're getting further and further away from bottling, everything's become much more integrated and uh, harmonious. And so um, it's not as disjointed and it's this, I, Really love the way it's shaping up, but you know it's kind of like watching him develop as a winemaker. You know, With, uh, when he started here in 1999 to uh, you know how, how what he does now. So yeah, when I started, I didn't know anything about wine. No, no, no. And I know a little something about wine. <laughs> you know, only 21, only 21 <laughs> years, but. Yeah. So gosh, man. yeah. So this is gonna be twenty second. So this will be yeah, your twenty second harvest here. Dang, I was eight years old when we started. <laughs> 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 you telling me that I'm old? <laughs> no, you are aging well, is what I'm saying. That's what I'm you're aging. He's a <laughs> yes, he has. You can tell all the evidence in the back. He keeps selling it very well back there. Yeah. Very well organized. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So, what, what other questions do we have? Yeah. Um, are there certain clones that you use in the Mr. Owls? Specific clones? Yes. Just for, I, well, I use the one to answer that. What was the way? No. She wants to know if there's any specific clones that we use 
in, in this realm. So. No, because every year is a little a little yeah. different. Every year is different. So yeah, um, yeah, well. you know, um, yeah, there there's limitations, but then there are limitations too. The, the limitations that we have with Mr. Owls is that we do want to make sure that um, our other ones are are taken care of. Um, that's for sure. Um, but um, but as we're going through there, Raul will taste things and say, hey, man, I really like some of this for Mr. Owls. And, um, mm -hmm. So, but no, we're not, there aren't any, I, is there a specific clone? Actually, I do know a specific clone um, that, um, well, I shouldn't say specific. You, if you can, anyway, you always like, um, as far as Syrah goes, if we can get any of the, um, Pepper Bridge or Seven Hills. Last, you know, well, 2017 Syrah. is the one that we used the, the seven. The Pepper Bridge uh, yeah. Syrah with the little yeah. well, well, the 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 So we, we had a little intro that we had yeah, on the seven, seven side for that. was 17. That was yeah. 17, yeah. 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 I think that's why it was a standout for me because I'm a sucker for that beer and yay with Syrah, man. I'm yeah, it's really, really pretty. It's really pretty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's good. I think the, the more it opens up, it's a little getting a little more like licorice. Yeah, yeah. So we have more like production questions. Uh, is there like a particular type of yeast that you like to use when making this wine, or does that also vary from vintage to vintage? You, you want to address that? Or want to? Well, the way it is, the yeast will be more specific to the grapes. So, so there's, keep in mind what there's five different grapes in here. I believe, um, or six, but I think there's five grapes in here. Um, so each one of those were vinified separately. So we use different yeasts on, um, on many of those. Uh, so it was more uh, varietal specific anyway, as far as the yeast selection goes. And so um, when Raul puts this blend together, we have these different uh, components. So we'll have different varietals. So we'll have the Cabernet Sauvignon in its own barrels over here. And it's already been vinified uh, and used the yeast that was best for that particular block of fruit. And the same thing for the Merlot, same thing for the Syrah. And so we're not choosing the yeast specifically for Mr. Owls. We're choosing it specifically for that uh, varietal and that actually that specific block of fruit. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that's that's how we go about vinifying those wines, and then we bring the in the blending process, bring those different components together. Yeah, because you you have to be open during the blending process, just because like you might have some standouts that you would think that would go well together, and you throw them together, and they're not yeah. ideal. So that's what's nice about it that it forces you to be open minded. Like this combination may have worked last year from these vineyards, these yeah, specific exactly. blocks, but that doesn't mean this next year with those same things is going to be the same. Yeah, you throw them together, they don't work. Yeah, so you set yeah, shoot from yeah, other blocks. Or so you have to try new stuff all that you have to step outside the box. You can't get comfortable mm -hmm. with the variety. Yeah. And so for the 2018, um, it's tasting really great now how long do you think it will age gosh you know this one i think um i i would give it well actually let me throw it over to the winemaker here. what do you what do you think winemaker i think age-wise i think you really lost the uh, you can take eight eight years easy i was gonna say Actually, we have nine, ten years, I think. So, yeah. But I think it actually, if you like more fruit, fruit forward wine, um, I would say um, in the next four or five years anyway, it's going to be really soft. In five years, I mean, this thing's going to be, you know, yeah. bedroom slipper soft. <laughs> no, I like that. It, I like that. You know, it's, it's soft right now. 
opinions that are so it's not far. So if you like younger, brighter uh, wines, I just even in the next year, two to three years, I'd be I'd be drinking this. But if you want to see a little bit more age, uh, um, a little more uh, cellar complexity, the you know it could last you know eight to ten years, I think. I think, that but you want to try it in the next year or so, and it's going to be awesome. Yeah, I, I think this is going to be probably be the most fun, actually, in, with, you know, say, between, oh, let's see, this is 2018 to 2020, so two, two years from now, so four to six years, probably, is when it's going to be at least the more, most fruit forward fun, if, if, if you will, you know, where it's just going to be, the fruit's going to be still be bright and jumping out of the glass. And then the, the tertiary flavors, in other words, the, all this cellar aging, bottle aging flavors are gonna start kicking in and stuff. So, um, um, and if you like older wines, well, yeah, six to nine years, this will be a fun, fun, fun wine. So, you, your thoughts? I mean, with, uh, with the aging, um, I'm on the, I like a, I'm the kind of guy who likes to enjoy the wine when it's young and then take a swing at it when it's been aged a little bit. Because uh, just for me personally, obviously I'm only seven years into the wine industry. Um, I'm, I'm just now in the past six to eight months, maybe 10 months where I've truly been appreciating the older wine characteristics. So I would, this would the this would be one because how approachable it is at this stage in its life. I would love to give this a swing down the road. You yeah. know, that Raola we commented on that about six months ago. You were really starting to like you know appreciate. Yeah, well, it's just the difference. Your, it's just the, it's just the difference, right? Of just under just appreciation, right? Like in order to appreciate what is, you have to know what was, right? So like. This is just one of those things. And I remember I would always tell him, like, oh, it's because, you know, you're young, <laughs> you're lacking in time, you know. And, and, and he's been. That's and, why he's called Mr. Rawls. He's, he's been right. He's, wise, he's, he's, been, he's been right. And, wise, yeah. and I think that's the fun part of being able to work with you guys is like allowing me to, like, okay, Dorian, you're wrong on this, but, you know, you're coming along. <laughs> <laughs> you're coming along. You're wrong, but you're coming along. Yeah, and but I, you don't I hear that, that as that. much. I love that. Yeah, I but like you, that. you hear that less and less. Humbling, I like it. I like it. But it, it's it's just fun, right? I mean, it's it's just really fun to to work with two different winemakers underneath the same house, right? Like they both have the same goal in mind, but I describe you guys as a yin and yang. You know, like you guys complete a circle, but there's different energies. Uh, to whom is to say what is what? That's up to y'all. That's not for me. But I love. All right, we 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 won't go there. Then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I, I love being able to to watch the synergy between the two of you, uh, the chemistry between the two of you, the trust between the two of you, um, the the room to grow between the two of you. It's super encouraging as the young guy well, on the team. It's really fun. And I really like the word the synergy adjective that you use there. Just simply, I think it's very applicable to this wine because I I really see the synergy of this blend wonderful blend that you put together and really folks i really encourage you uh, this is an exciting mr owl so i i think it's one of the most exciting ones that we've made, ever made and this is something to you know uh try it now and uh you know like I say it's a great value it's it's a great you know uh weekday wine if you will and uh, uh try it and uh Try it, try it again. I think one of you guys made that comment, you know. And yeah. Just just keep trying it. I mean, this is this stuff is really worth, you know, if you can get a half case or a case of it, yeah. just try it over that, you know, over the next six years. It's uh, if you can keep it in your cellar that long. Well, I, it's I don't like, know, yeah. that'd be tough. I, yeah. I don't know. You might go through this. It's well, and it's really like you, it's the way I look at it, honestly, is like, Every time I open up a bottle of Mr. Owls, it's like I get to sit with my friend. I get to sit with my friend, Raul. Like, I get to, <laughs> the guy who's, you know, who I work with 40 hours a week, sometimes 80 to 100 hours a week during harvest. Like, I feel like if, uh, God forbid, there was ever a day I was not here anymore, if I ever wanted to talk to Raul, I would just, 
open up one of these <laughs> and just say, how you doing, my friend? You know, because... Uh, Oh boy, it's, uh, we're getting sentimental here. It's just the way that I look at it. This is this is this is Rob in a bottle. Um, <laughs> <laughs> every year he's a little different, but he's always fun. <laughs> All right. All right, Abby. More, more questions. Can you guys talk about food pairings? Pardon me? Food pairings with the uh, what would you eat this with? Or hmm. Mr. O, what would you like this hmm. with? I think he goes well. Any hmm. <laughs> I you know <clears throat> this guy I just um actually had some wonderful we barbecued some wonderful lamb last night and I should say grilled some wonderful lamb man. Um, I, I think this would, would have paired just be beautifully with it. But I can also see this with, um, gosh, is any um, tenderloin it would be beautiful with. Um, you know, we we're talking Italian. Um, um, we had some um, uh, rigatoni a few nights ago that we made at home. And I could see this with the rigatoni, uh, especially, you know, with that anise in there mm -hmm. and um, with the Italian sausage that was in there, uh, the fennel and stuff. Um, it, you know, just the, the red, anything, you know, the, uh, the tomatoes and stuff, the tomato sauces, it's just wonderful. But my, when I think of this though, I, I truly, truly, just I I think it just a wonderful. I'm, if you guys listen to me, I'll, you you know that I love my my uh, my beef blue rare. And, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I I just have visions. Well, it's nice because there's more acid with blue rare too. It gives you a little more acid in the meat than, than too. And uh, but anyway, this is I think would, would pair wonderfully with, with this, but. With burgers, you name it, you know, take some burgers and throw a little Worcestershire sauce in the burgers uh, before you cook it um, and before you grill those burgers. Um, yeah, all, all of that is, is really good. So I almost kind of put it in a line just, you know, kind of be between Bordeaux and, um, and uh, Chianti in, in, a, in a sense um, as far as... Uh, I'm just thinking the acid, you know, the Barbaresco and, um, uh, but also the Chianti, the acid and San Giovese. And so, so yeah, I, this could go with a lot of uh, wonderful uh, Italian food, but um, yeah, any, anything beef, it's, it's going to go. <laughs> I have a question for Raul and that is you, also have your own winery and was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about your other winemaking experience. Well, <laughs> that's an easy question. <laughs> well, I like, I like going to the vineyard and because to me, harvesting at the right time when you harvest the grape, it has to be in the right time. And to me, the going to the vineyards, to the vineyard and looking to my own grapes and making the decisions when to pick it and, and then how to manage it, how, what yeast did I use and how to manage it, I think it's one of the things that I really like about that. I learned a lot from Chuck and I, and I thank you for, teaching me all I know, but. Well, you taught yourself a lot. But having my own winery, I like it a lot because, because I, it, it's tough to know when to pick the grapes, the right time to pick the grapes. And I think that's how, you, where the winemaking starts because if you don't pick the grapes at the right time, it's a big mistake and you can't really fix it if you don't yeah. pick the grapes on the right time. And 
and it's a little first it was a little scary for me to go and like pull the trigger when to pick the grapes and i'm still scared to go and <laughs> it is that's a scary it's thing. like you're okay, always second guessing you go and tell the crew or like the manager with your pick tomorrow and you're not even sure if you're doing the right thing <laughs> <laughs> So it's it's yeah. tough. Yeah, it, it's e easy to call the shots, that second guess the boss. You know, when you when you're working back in production, that when you actually have to go out there and pull the trigger yourself, it's it's a whole other story. And I think that's one of the hardest decisions to make when you have to like we said pull the trigger on the on mm -hmm. the grapes because you go and there's one thing you go and look at the vineyard and you see the grapes all oh, they're ripe but you bring them to the winery and do all the tests on it and the sugar and like the acid everything says like it's good but the taste the flavor is not there so what do you do even the color is not there but everything else says that it's ready mm -hmm. but the flavor is not there so you're like should i pick it or should I wait mm. two more days three more days <laughs> and it really makes a big difference it really makes a big difference one or two days when like if I pick it today or two more days later yeah. it really makes a difference that's so funny because every conversation I've had with winemakers we talk about that in the, when we were first learning too talking exactly like you are with and everybody says, you know, I knew what to do. It was a lot easier when I was working in production and I, <laughs> I, I knew exactly what to do. And I, I couldn't understand why, you know, John Smith winemaker, why he wasn't picking now or why did, why did he wait so long and all this. And, you know, so you always make the perfect decision when you're working in production. You have to go out and do it yourself. Man. And then it's that. Uh, Holy crap, what am I doing? <laughs> am I doing the right thing? Yeah, like if then you go in the vineyard and then everything looks right and you get confused. To me, I get confused because if you look at it and obviously you're surrounded with Well, you have to different. look inside the cluster though, too. So you just don't look at the berries on the outside because there's a lot of berries on the inside of the cluster. Have they colored up? No, mm -hmm. so so when you go and stick it on the sorting table and all the berries get knocked off the cluster well then a lot of those berries on the inside well some of the outer side you know berries may me they'll color up you know more or earlier than the inside one so you gotta when when that happens and, then, and yeah then we have to walk the roads because you would be in the upper side of them. Let's say there's a hill on the upper side might be a little more ripe, but on the lower side or they get more water, it could be or not. the east side of the road yeah. versus the west side. So you have to have to judge and like Yeah, there's know. there's been times where we have harvested say um the west side of the road. If you have a north south orientation of the roads, the the west side of the row, there's been some vintage is where we'll um, harvest that first we harvest it a couple of days before the east side so um and if there's variations in the blocks too we might have two or three picks in there so um, when i say variation where there's it might be hill variations within the block and, uh, so in some years certain parts of the block will ripen a little earlier you know a couple you know two or three days can make a huge huge difference yeah. So yeah. there's usually you got about a, at most maybe a four or five day window in, um, to harvest. And, and a lot of it too depends on the style of wine that you want to make. And so um, I'll go into a vineyard and see that XYZ winery, you know, pick today and I'm going, what the hell are they thinking? Why the heck would they, why would they even think about picking today? You know, and I'm not even thinking about picking for another week to 10 days, but everybody has different goals and what they're doing. And so a situation like that, they might be looking for a little more acid or, uh, to be blending with something else that they have in their vineyard. So you never really second guess, you know, other winemakers why they're doing, we all have our specific reasons 
uh, for for doing something. So it's not like we. I can't say they're doing it wrong or we're doing it yeah. right. It just different yeah. wine makers. Yeah. yeah, different styles and different different, different needs. Yeah. So, all right, what else you got there? Um, someone was wondering what the old label looks like, and I don't think we have a bottle accessible, so I'm just going to do a quick screen share to show people what the old Mr. Owl um, bottles. There we go. Yes, sir. Yeah, so this is what the uh, original label looked like when uh, Chuck made it for that first 2002 vintage. Um, that was the surprise for Raul. The mustache is a little thicker now on Raul. His mustache is a little <laughs> thicker than on that label, but it's pretty close. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so there you go. So there's Mr. Owls right there. <laughs> and we got Mr. Owl up here, mm -hmm. our, our mascot for the day, the evening. There we go. So Mr. Owl says, what do you look like? Goodbye. What do you guys think? <laughs> I mean, both of you guys are around. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. oh, my gosh. Anyway, so, so there you go. So thank you for joining us tonight. Yeah, we really, really appreciate it. Enjoy your Mr. Owls. And uh, now you know a little bit more of the story. And uh, the, the guys that are responsible for it. So, um, so thank you very much. So take care, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Sir Dorian. Thank you. Dorian. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers to you all. Take care.